today ladies and gentlemen there are thousands of stocks out there personally I like dividend stocks and I've realized a lot of you are new to investing some of you are experienced and you're just trying to learn other people's strategies but today I'm gonna to break down for you the simplest way I currently look for analyze and choose when to buy that right dividend stock for that juicy yield uh, in perpetuity hopefully for the rest of my life because I am on my financial independence retire early journey and hopefully this helps you figure out your own so let's jump <laughs> Welcome back, my passive income investors. Today, it's gonna to be an awesome day. I'm gonna show you my strategies behind buying dividend stocks, when to choose, how to know, and what to pick. Because when you're in the beginning of this, guys, you might uh, not have a lot of money, you might have a lot of money, and I wanna show you exactly how to do this, whatever end you're on. And this is just gonna be a good overview. If you have any questions at all, never hesitate in the comment section below. And this is an incredibly um, large amount of information for me to be revealing, so consider slapping a like if this is something that helps you. But watch first, make sure it's gonna be something that helps you. So let's jump right into this, guys starting with the step-by-step -step guide to my own personal dividend investing strategy starting with diversifying guys if you were new to investing maybe you got 500 bucks maybe you got a million bucks it's really gonna change your risk tolerance level and you're gonna be looking at picking a way of diversifying if you have say millions of dollars you're not gonna want to take on a lot of risk you're gonna want to buy maybe something like what is called the S&P 500 index or also known as a Vanguard 500 index fund which makes up the 500 largest companies in the US the safest thing we all know you can invest into it is the benchmark for every investor and everyone compares themselves to that index fund and it's the buy or none the best thing ever because it has a guaranteed rate of return over 20 years nothing's guaranteed but over a hundred year history that's what it has done so you have to understand uh, what way you're gonna want to diversify which leads you to the second step which comes down to sectors now once you understand uh, how you're going to be diversifying, whether you're going to take on more risk or lower risk, individual companies come with higher risk, more volatility. Indexes come with lower volatility, lower risk, just less upside, obviously, right? So if you're trying to build an account, you probably want to take on a little more risk. So what you're going to do here then, guys, is you're going to look into the sectors. There are dozens or so sectors out there, everything from utilities, um, like the companies that keep the hydro on, tech companies we all know, like Microsoft and Apple, finance, health, goes on and on and on. So the first thing you're going to have to ask yourself is what do you know the most about? That's where you're going to start. Uh, do you know more about um, like 3M is a company that makes these pens? I do believe 3M makes a lot of random stuff. But do you know enough about 3M to understand what its best products are, uh, who's buying them, who's selling them? It's kind of like Monster. Do you drink Monster Energy drinks? Maybe you know that company pretty well and you think you'd understand it. Start with things that are simple to you, things that you know you know better than anybody else. It might even be cars. Maybe you know about more about GM or Ford and you think that they're going to be an explosive thing into the future. But it, it all comes down to your knowledge at this point, guys. So start focusing on something you understand. Maybe it's phones. You understand Apple. You get their atmosphere. That might be a good place to start. You don't just start loading up on random stocks and sectors. Like I said, what I'll usually do is I'll start listening. Uh, that I'll, you know, Let me come back to that because it's more toward the bottom here. I just want you to understand the basic concepts behind this first. So after we figured out the sectors we're interested in that we know most about, we can start analyzing the companies within that sector, guys. And then what we're going to want to do is what I call um, diversifying between market caps. Um, so there are a bunch of different sized companies. Uh, we're talking like Apple and Microsoft hit the trillion dollar plus mark. Massive, massive, massive conglomerates, guys. AT T conglomerate, but maybe we're going to look into something smaller like a real estate investment trust. The company might only be worth a hundred million, or really, there's tiny companies out there, guys. And these are called low float, high risk companies because essentially they're usually up and coming. A hundred million dollars sounds like a lot of money, but it is not a lot of money in the investing world, guys. And smaller cap companies have a higher risk between bigger competitors, people wiping them out. It comes with a whole new subset of risks. So you have to be careful about what you're investing in um, when you're looking at market caps. And what I try and do is pick. Um, usually large and small size or mid-size market caps and usually pick one of each because usually the smaller cap companies have higher growth rates where the bigger companies work is what I would call battleships or moats they're just they're not very fast moving but they're stable they pay healthy dividends and you know they're not going to be unreliable 10 20 years from now so market cap and size matters uh, in my own portfolio if you guys continue to watch this YouTube channel you will and if you're enjoying this information like I said guys if you're gonna learn something here slap a like I'm, I'm doing everything I can for you I want to give back so I'm hoping this is helping you out um, this is the boring stuff I know for some of you advanced guys but we're getting there trust me so market cap um, figure that out guys uh, like a good example is I own a company called GEO really volatile company really small market cap and then you can compare it to a company like Apple that's worth uh, almost a trillion or Microsoft it's well over a trillion at this point right like there's there's just a big big difference between those guys uh, the big big caps are your safe stocks Remember, the small caps are your risky. In fact, if it's too small, it won't even sit on the normal index. And that is what we call the pink sheets. 
the junk market uh, where basically upcoming companies that have crazy high risk, that's where most of the marijuana companies sit. Um, a lot of these crypto spaces will sit within that realm as well. The next thing we're going to look at is the most important thing, and it's usually the thing that I will look at first. I don't recommend you look at it first, but it's what I usually go to, which is obviously the dividends. Um, now, this is where a lot of confusion comes in, because if a company has a high dividend rate, um, usually it's paying out most of its income, which is something that REITs or real estate trusts have to do by law. They are actually abided by the government law to pay out a certain amount of dividends because you own a piece of the real estate, so you have a certain right to it to protect the shareholders as is. So the next thing you're going to ask yourself, guys, is the yield reliable? Um, when you're looking at dividend stocks specifically, guys, sometimes a smaller yield doesn't mean a worse dividend stock. You can look at companies like Johnson & Johnson, which is something that I'm going to bring up a lot, and a company like Starbucks or McDonald's that pay really low dividend yields. But if you look over time, they actually increase those yields. And usually in a 10, 15 year time period, that yield will go from a 2% to a 6 to even 10%. Or if you're holding a company like Altria Group is one of the fastest um, and presumed to be one of the best uh, growth stocks dividend wise ever in history. Um, if you bought it, I think it was not even 10 years ago, you would be getting over a 20% dividend yield as of today. So could you imagine making a 20% return on your money every year paid out to you in cash? Um, that is a reality that can happen, but it won't happen usually with those high, high, high flying yield companies. If a company's paying out 10 or 15%, usually there's an underlying thing with the company you really need to pay attention to. Currently, the highest yielding stock I own, again, uh, is a company called GEO Group. It's a prison stock, and I picked it knowing there was going to be some volatility, and I picked it at the bad time. I'm actually down on that position, but that company pays out right now about an 11 or 12% dividend yield that I think is reliable. Um, it will fluctuate, uh, and it's not, I don't, well, it goes up over time, but I mean, I don't expect it to go up. I just hope that it continues paying a yield between 6 and 10%. Whereas I own a company like Apple and Microsoft, where I know they have so much money in the bank over time, I'm expecting them to grow that dividend yield along with the capital growth of it as well. And you can see the differences in what might be safer and what might not be because I'm down huge on GEO, but I'm up huge on Apple. So is it really worth getting that high yield knowing there's going to be crazy fluctuations? It comes down again to your risk tolerance, guys. Um, so what you got to do now is how to tell when a company is cheap. And like I just mentioned, Johnson & Johnson, guys, um, to tell when a company is cheap, you really got to uh, keep your ears open. So the next two things kind of go hand in hand. So what you need to do is listen to your community. This is part of the community. Anybody on YouTube that's talking about finance, listen to them. Don't take their advice with a grain of salt. You're going to have to do your own homework. But keep your ears open because that's the only way you're going to learn anything, guys. I have made some of my biggest trades because I kept my ears open that made me the most money. And you got to take everything with a grain of salt because you're the one making the decision at the end of this. But usually somebody in the community will do is they'll start talking about companies they think are cheap or somebody will keep talking about certain industries. And that's what you're going to want to. But what you don't want to do, guys, is chase money. Um, and that is something that I've learned really well over the last six years is I will not buy companies that just keep going up and up and up. It's sometimes a bad thing because I'm not doing my homework. But the fact is there's thousands of companies out there and you're not going to be able to educate yourself on all of them. So let the community help you out. Listen to what they're talking about and look into what they talk about and see if it makes sense. Like for instance, most stocks right now are on the run. If you look at McDonald's, Starbucks, all those companies charts are unbelievable. Like they just keep going up and up and up. But that can't go on forever, and I just don't see them as cheap companies anymore, and I don't want to be that guy that overpays for companies because that's not how you get rich in the stock market. That's not how I've been able to sustain like a 15 to 20% return over time. That won't happen with me doing that. So what I need to do is listen to the community, taking some advice, and currently the sectors that I focus most on this year is drug and pharmaceutical. Something weird has been going on in the pharmaceutical world where like Pfizer, the company that made Viagra, that you're talking about Johnson & Johnson, these huge, well, Pfizer is pretty small, but uh, when we're talking about a company like Johnson & Johnson, it is a company that has been flat for two or three years. It is a ginormous company with a great uh, income that can support its yields no matter what, and it's just been getting some bad news uh, that it hasn't been treating the stock very well, which leads you to understand why I think Johnson & Johnson's on sale. Uh, I've heard Kevin O'Leary talk about it, uh, PPC, and there's so many people in the community that talk about Johnson & Johnson and what is going on in the pharmaceutical sector because it's the only part of the sector that hasn't been growing. Uh, it, it's been growing the balance sheet but because of these lawsuits and the way the media portrays it and the fact that everyone hates the medical uh, sector right now because there's risk, the government's been stepping in and putting a lot of policy behind drugs. But the fact of the matter is I think these companies are very well and they're going to be sustainable and they're like those moats. They're just tankers. They don't go up much. They don't go down much. But I think they've been going sideways for too long because the balance sheet's growing. When the balance sheet grows but the stock stays flat, usually we start heading into discount territory at some point, which makes me want to uh, basically purchase those kind of stocks. Johnson & Johnson doesn't pay the highest starting dividend yield, but 
let's move back over to a company like Altria Group. The drug sector came down in 2018 with the rest of the markets for no real good reason. Uh, the story's never changed, but the markets have really been battering uh, the vape industry, the marijuana industry, and it's been really kind of pressuring these really large tobacco companies. But the fact of the matter is their balance sheets haven't really changed at all. They can sustain their dividends, no problem. And in fact, they're even growing their dividends. Um, so I have mainly been shoveling money hand over fist into those markets because I think maybe in a year or two, maybe five years from now, they're going to come back to at least at par. And when they do come back up to at par, we're going to be rocking, guys. Um, I'm going to teach you a few tricks in a second that I'm going to call my advanced tricks, but let me just get through the rest of this and I'll try and tell you how you're going to pick your first dividend stock to buy. But it starts with listening to the community, guys, and then you're going to have to basically find stocks that aren't high flying. Sooner or later, you're going to get bit in the butt on one of these high flyers, guys, and when it drops 20 or 30 percent, it takes 10 to 15 years to recover. You're going to be missing out on a lot of capital growth, um, which also comes into cost averaging and drips. So this is what I want to get to next year, guys. Um, cost averaging into stocks is going to protect you from those high flyers and drip systems are also going to do that. What a drip system is, is it just means it takes the dividends it pays you and you put those dividends back into the company. And it's usually completely free. Uh, usually the, the stock investing companies like M1 Finance, uh, Scotia iTrade, what I use, they do it automatically and they don't charge you to do it. The company just pays you out in shares instead of cash. Um, which trust me is a lot better because those shares pay you more cash down the road. So you don't want to find what they call like a bombshell or a, a hidden mine um, or a lemon where you buy a company and you keep putting dividends into it, but it keeps going down and it never comes back. And eventually the company starts liquidating stuff. I've seen a lot of companies like that lately. A lot of REITs have been like that. Uh, their senior housing property trust has come down a lot over the last few years and it's been kind of a yield trap as they call them for people. But what you want to do to protect yourself is if you found a good company, you want to cost average in and um, you want to set up drips because this is going to sustain you that if you find a company you really like and you don't mind overpaying for it and you overpay for it and then it drops 20%, you have to kind of stomach it. Again, it comes back to risk tolerance. Are you going to be able to handle that 20% drop? Because at that point, it's going to be an opera buying opportunity, which means you need to make more money. You got to come up with more capital or take the dividends you're making and buy more shares back because you're going to get them cheaper, which is going to bring your overall buy price down. And that's going to protect you against those massive fluctuations. Uh, in 2008, one of the greatest market crashes that ever happened, guys. If you bought at the uh, beginning of 2008 and it crashed and everyone told you to get, to get the hell out of the markets and you owned really good companies like Johnson & Johnson, why didn't you, you should have just get, you kept buying them all the way down and you'd have been looking at your account that might have been dropped 50%. You'd have been like, well, I'm still getting paid. It's all that matters. And then sure enough, guys, ten, another 10 years go by and look at what happened. I mean, you would be fine. You'd be perfectly fine. So remember, cost averaging is a really good tool. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is when should I sell? Um, and to be honest, if you are in the mindset that I have, you should never sell except to keep even. Um, when you become overweighted in certain stocks, I recently just sold out some of my Apple because I had over 20,000 in it, which made up a massive percentage of my portfolio. I think Apple's one of the greatest companies in the world, but that doesn't mean it's gonna perform the best. That's what you have to understand. Um, to put it in perspective, I put Apple up against Microsoft and I own more Apple than I did Microsoft and I was severely overweighted in Apple and I only had about, what is it, like seven, $8,000 in Microsoft. And all of a sudden, Microsoft just smashed it. Uh, I'm up 40% on that position. I went from 100 bucks to a buck 40 is where it's kind of hovering between the 135 and 140 mark. Apple has kind of been getting up, but it hasn't been doing nearly as well. And I own way more of it. So you're better off diversifying because you just don't know what ones are going to do the best. So why not own the basket of the best and just own an even amount and don't focus on what ones are going to do the best because it's just going to stress you out. So the only time you should really be selling stocks is if a stock story has changed or um, just to keep yourself diversified because sometimes stocks, guys, you can own them, these businesses that you know really well and all of a sudden the story changes, new CEOs come in, they decide they wanna do something you don't agree with and you, you say, you know what, I, I can't do that and you're just gonna to have to move on with it and get rid of it. I've done that quite a few times. I recently did it with something called Brookfield Real Estate Services. I did it with a company called Hydro One. Um, I do it with companies where I, I go into it with an understanding of the company and if that changes over time and I'm not comfortable anymore, I will just simply sell out of it. That happened with Constellation Brands recently. Uh, one of my favorite companies of all time, they own Canopy Growth Corp, or a good percentage of it, and they recently fired Bruce Linton. Um, and that came to a shock and me because if you know what's going on in the marijuana industry, there's not a lot of money be ma being made. A lot of you look at these balance sheets and think that's good money, and it's not. Trust me, there's metric tons of weed lying around going to waste. Not really going to waste. It's kind of getting shoveled out back doors into people's trucks. 
don't think anything goes to waste. But the problem is, is it's not being reflected on the balance sheet. And uh, Constellation Brands did not like that coming from the largest marijuana company, and they decided to fire Bruce Linton. But Bruce Linton's the guy that just sits around and he's waiting for policy to come into play to make it more beneficial for them. And while they do that, he's been building that company into a billion dollar profit machine and with the potential to be a profit machine. And it's it's been amazing. And I'm just shocked that they got rid of the guy that knows the best about the industry. He is the hammer and nail for the marijuana industry. And that shocked me. I, I believed in Bruce Linton and I believed in Constellation Brands. I believed in what they were doing until they fired him, um, which shocked me and I just didn't agree with it. So I sold it and I'm not regretting it and I'm not looking back. It's a shame because I really enjoyed the alcohol part of that business, but I just, I don't know if it's a decision I wouldn't make and they make it and I don't agree with it. As a shareholder, I should have had rights to uh, make those decisions and I don't think uh, they have the right to make those. Well, they, they actually have the right, but I don't feel as a shareholder it was appropriate. So I moved on, simple as that. So I wanna show you guys a few tips and tricks and what I'm personally doing uh, when it comes to finding the right dividend stocks to buy and what I basically do to choose so. So the first thing we're going to talk about guys is my goal for the end of my portfolio over the next three to five years. I want to be making somewhere between a six to 10% dividend. Most companies only pay two to 4%, but companies that I'm looking at right now, guys, like the drug sector, um, they just, the dividend yields are so high. You got to remember, like I said, when you're buying stocks, you also have to remember just because the dividend yield starts slow, doesn't mean it doesn't increase over time. And in five years, that dividend yield could go from a 2% to a 5% if you just buy the right companies. So essentially what my end goal, first of all, is to get to a six to 10% yield on probably around a couple hundred thousand dollars. I want to be bringing in somewhere between 12 and $20,000 in dividends in the next uh, few years at the most. So I, I know what I want. I know, I know the yields I'm going for. I know the companies that I like. So what I do is I keep my ears open. I listen to the stock guys and I hear about companies. I hear about companies. Now I'm still filling out my sectors because my personal goal is to own at least two to three companies in every sector. The tech sector for me is done. I own enough in the tech sector. I figured out what utilities I want. I own the finance companies I want other than insurance. I wouldn't mind owning an insurance company, but I don't understand insurance that well. So I kind of stay away from it until I'm ready to educate myself on it. Um, healthcare is one that I'm currently looking at right now. And this year I've been focusing heavily on the drug sector, including companies like Altria, British American Tobacco. Now, a t one of my favorite, my favorite tips of all time, um, when you buy anything, there is an underlying fundamental to that company. And that underlying fundamental is the net assets versus liabilities. So assets are what you own. Do you own a house? Do you own materials? Do you own a warehouse filled with stuff? What is the value of that? How much debt do you have? How much do you owe to people and shareholders? Minus that from the actual owning equity of the company and figure out what that's worth because this is what you're gonna be paying for the company. We're gonna start with the equity value of it. So any assets, any equity, cash laying in the bank, that all comes into a fine cash value. It's really easy to denominate. So you can look at it and say, okay, I know for a fact, um, let's just take a random company, we'll call it the card company. They have a warehouse filled with playing cards and um, their inventory, the real estate they own that houses that playing cards, they don't rent it, they own it. So say they own the building where they're storing in their factory and where they have the machines that build the cards and everything is in one spot. And say that factory is worth $2 million, it's got about 20 employees and um, it's sitting on about a million dollars worth of product. Well, it's gonna be really easy to say with a million dollars worth of product that they know is moving, the factory's worth a million, like it's really easy to come up and say, okay, this company's probably worth about two or three million just if I were to sell everything today. And then we can add the employees into that valuation because let's be real, it's not hard managing employees. Or it's hard, let's be real, it's really hard to manage employees and put a company together and a brand together. So that comes into the valuation as well. But what I always like to do guys is focus on the underlying value because a company that I'm buying right now called British American Tobacco, when I was buying that at the very bottom of it, it was literally worth a tiny bit more than the assets it was holding. Um, so when you're, you're literally paying the base value, and what you have to understand is if a company goes bankrupt and they lose all their income, they still have assets they liquidate and that will get paid out to shareholders. So that is a way of diversifying your own risk. If you're buying something that's really close to the underlying asset value, you know if they have to liquidate everything and even if they don't get what that's fully worth, you know you're still gonna get a good chunk of money back after the A shareholders are paid and all the debts are paid. So you wanna figure out what their debts versus liabilities are so when you divide all of that out and minus all their liabilities versus their actual assets, and then you can actually work that into the market cap 
and you can figure out, do they have as much assets as their market cap is worth? And say the company's worth $100 million, but they only have $5 million in assets. Well, that means you're really paying a lot, a high premium for those assets. And are those assets as valuable as that premium? Uh, when you look at the marijuana industry, guys, that's where you're going to see a lot of these high-flying valuations. A company like Tesla, is the brand worth the company's value? And that's when you get volatility because that's the big debate. Is in the future, is that brand going to be so valuable that it's worth paying the premium today? It's a very hard debate. So what I look for specifically, of above all things, is I keep my ears open and when I hear about a company in a sector that I'm interested in that I either don't already own or I'm currently buying in, I literally will stop almost everything I'm doing and start analyzing that company. And the one that I'm looking at right now, guys, uh, one of the biggest ones that I'm looking at is Johnson uh, J&J. If you look up J&J, guys, it is the one that I keep mentioning throughout this video. And the pharmaceutical industry right now, I think, is down with the, uh, the drug industry. There are two uh, parts of the market that have been really pushed into a hole, and I don't think they deserve that. And this is where you're going to start seeing real valuation, because essentially the market has decided they don't like that company. But why have they decided that? Is it because the company actually is doing poorly? It's not going to make money? It's failing at what it's doing? Then yeah, that would make sense. The stock should be going down. But if the underlying assets are going up, the fundamentals have never changed. But the rhetoric around the company is we hate this company. It's bad. It's horrible. You shouldn't be buying it. It's terrible. Sin stocks. Terrible. Prison stocks. G.E. Ogre. Why are you owning prisons? A horrible company. They're going to banish those in the future. They're going to privatize. They get rid of them all together and you're going to lose all your money. Yeah. Okay, right? That's all hearsay. It's just bullshit. Uh, it's just shit people say, but it's not a fact. It's not concrete. I can't make a decision on that because I can't write it down and say, okay, this is going to happen because of this and it's affecting this, so I should get rid of it because it's only going to make this worse. That would make sense. So this is how you make real money in dividend investing, guys, because you're going to find companies like Johnson & Johnson that have had such bad rhetoric, rhetoric around it, like just bad karma. Like a lot of people are just pushing it into the ground, but really the company's still amazing. They're not firing employees. They're raising money. The balance sheet's going up. They're paying their dividends. They're increasing dividends. So when you look at it and you just block the noise out, you start seeing real clearly about if this company is going to be worth buying or not. And that's when you can make the final decision for yourself if that's what you're going to want to buy. But I'm honestly, I've got some money sitting on the side right now and I think I'm going to start purchasing my first tranche of Johnson & Johnson. I own a lot of high risk companies because I'm young and uh, starting investing guys, I literally own under a dozen companies. And the only sectors I really own are utility, tech, a um, little bit of finance. I've been really loading up on the uh, SIN stocks, uh, prison stock GO group I think has been undervalued. And then on top of that, on top of that, right now, guys, I'm starting to look at the pharmaceutical industry. I have no, f I have no, uh, I have no, uh, no uh, stocks that I own in the pharmaceutical industry. But it's it's something that I want to get into. Um, I would really like to own something like Procter and Gamble again. I used to own it. I wish I held on to it. Uh, Starbucks is one that I wish I bought when I saw the dips. Um, those kind of companies, guys, they only give blimp moments to buy on deals. And if you buy those companies at their all time highs, you're not going to see the same advantage that you are if you're buying companies that come up on sale. So when you wanna take sales, guys, you wanna find these deals, you wanna you want to get them at a good valuation, just be patient. If you're young like me, take your time. There's no rush on any of this. And just slowly start averaging into companies you like. And then wait for that moment when they're like, okay, this stock's down a lot. Why is it down so much? And all the big people you listen to, like for me, it's Kevin O'Leary, it's, it's Grant Cardone. Like I listen to literally hundreds of people, like YouTube channels, small, big, everything else in between. And I listen and I listen and it, does something make sense to me? Why are these big guys and these small guys talking about these companies? What's going on in this industry? Is it real? Is it fake? Let me look at their balance sheet, um, which is the last thing that I'm not going to talk about on here, but it's something you should also pay attention to, guys. If you don't understand how to read a balance sheet, take a course. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll make a follow-up video to this uh, next week and I'll actually show you how to properly analyze a balance sheet because it varies drastically. Marijuana industry, you're going to be paying really high PEs. And in fact, a company can only have a PE ratio of it. It's profitable. So when you look at companies like uh, Tesla, non-profitable, so they're not going to show a positive PE ratio and they're not going to show any price to earnings. So when a company has earnings come in, that earnings gets judged against their market cap. So as the earnings come in, we look at the market cap and that market cap versus earnings is going to tell you how much you're paying for how much the company makes versus the size of the company and how long it's going to take for that company to make enough earnings to pay it back. And again, just because it has a low market cap doesn't mean it's going to be a good company either, guys. A lot of this is hard to gauge. Like take a company like GameStop. It looks cheap, but it's not worth buying. Uh, anyways, again, guys, consider slapping a like. I've talked about a lot today. I don't want to bug you anymore. I'm in between jobs and I love making these videos on weekends because on weekends, the markets aren't open. I'm not distracted and I feel like I can educate you guys a little bit more on what it takes to do some of this stuff. Um, let me know too if you want me to actually keep uh, 
uh, doing some dividend breakdown. Maybe what I'll do is a comparison on the computer screen and show you all of um, the, the balance sheet stuff and how all of that works just to help you out a little more. But again, guys, remember, start with all of everything I told you here, listen to the community and keep watching channels like this and you're gonna do just fine. So stay cool, stay awesome. I look forward to chatting you real soon.